Thank you. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share um, some of my work on an intervention um, in rural Uganda. We all know that the majority of people who are HIV positive worldwide are still unaware of their status. We also know that HIV testing and counseling can be effective at helping people change their behavior, but we see this more for people who test positive, but less so for people who test negative. Furthermore, a lot of these studies are older studies where VCT was the primary model for HIV testing, and counseling was much longer than we see with provider-initiated testing, where counseling may be as short as five to 10 minutes. So we obviously then wonder whether or not provider-initiated testing will still be effective at helping people change behavior. And furthermore, how can we potentially maximize the time that we have to do very sort of um, potent counseling to maximize potential behavior change. So that was really the goal of our intervention. Um, our intervention was based on the information, motivation, behavioral skills model. And we used motivational interviewing techniques where counselors um, delivered client-centered counseling to help patients identify their risk behaviors, choose a behavior that they thought they could change, um, they discussed barriers to change and how they might overcome those barriers and ultimately develop a risk reduction plan. We also designed the intervention to be very brief so that if it was effective, it could be sustainable. So our hypothesis was that our motivational interviewing-based client-centered counseling that was implemented during provider-initiated HIV testing with outpatients will be more effective than the standard of care counseling at reducing sexual risk behavior and related outcomes. So the study takes place in a village called Gombe in Uganda, which is in Butambala district, which is about two hours from the capital city of Kampala. Um, Gombe Hospital is a comprehensive public hospital which has a large HIV clinic and has been implementing routine provider-initiated testing with all outpatients for the last eight years. We recruited patients from the outpatient department and our study design was a historical control. So we recruited patients for the control condition, interviewed them at baseline, um, they received standard of care, for HIV testing and counseling. And then we followed them up three and six months later. Um, after data collection was complete for the control group, we enrolled participants in the intervention. Um, they were also interviewed at baseline. And when they received HIV testing, instead of the standard of care counseling, they received client-centered motivational interviewing-based counseling while they were waiting for their test results. We also then followed them up three and six months later. So we were specifically interested, interested in um, risk behavior change. So we asked people to report the number of times they had sex in the prior three months with their three most recent partners, how many of those times involved condom use, what type of partner it was with, and whether or not they knew their partner's HIV status. And we defined knowledge of partner status as the partner having tested within the prior 12 months. We're very interested in risky sexual events specifically. So we define risky sexual events as um, unprotected sex with a zero discordant or unknown status partner. So therefore, unprotected sex with a zero concordant partner was not considered risky. Um, our participants were quite similar between our control and our intervention condition. About half were women, average age was 33. Most were married, fairly low levels of education, um, sporadic employment, and employment was the one variable that the control and intervention groups differed on. So we could, uh, included that in our analyses to control for that difference. About 17% were testing for HIV for the first time. And we retained over 90% of both of the samples through the six-month follow-up. Um, about uh, 9 to 10% tested HIV positive, and only about 20 to 22% knew all of their partner's HIV status. 
They reported engaging in about 21 um, sexual events during the three-month measurement window at baseline, and about 73% of these were um, risky sexual events. So first, if we look at the impact of the intervention on whether or not people knew their partner's HIV status, um, what we see, um, looking at the three and six month follow-up data, um, which is reflecting uptake of partner testing, is that there was no difference between the control and the intervention as far as uptake of partner testing. You do obviously see, though, that there's a big difference between men and women in that men were much more um, effective at getting their partners to test for HIV than were women, which is not surprising. Now if we look at risk behavior, um, specifically here we're looking at the percentage of total sex acts that were risky. Um, our intervention condition is shown in the red lines and the control in the blue lines. So we can see that for the intervention participants, they decreased risk over time, whereas those in the control condition initially decreased risk, but then subsequently increased risk at six-month follow-up. So the intervention was more effective than the control at reducing risk. Um, I did um, put the results by HIV test results, but there were no differences in the intervention outcomes by HIV test results. Now if we look specifically at um, the number of risky sex events, which I think is a, a better indicator of um, actual, the magnitude of potential HIV transmission, because obviously someone engaging in more risky sex acts has more potential for HIV transmission than someone with fewer acts. Just like the last so slide, we see that for intervention participants, they reported decreased risk over time whereas control participants reported um, initially decreased risk, but then subsequent increase in risk at six-month follow-up. So we might wonder that how specifically did risk decrease? Was it just that people got their partners tested, or was it that there was actual a sexual behavior change in terms of increased condom use or maybe overall just decreased um, risk events? So if you look at the solid lines in these graphs for both men and women, what we see is that for participants having sex with unknown status partners, the number of risk events for people in the intervention condition decreased, whereas for people in the control condition, it increased. So in other words, what we're seeing is that there was actual sexual risk behavior change um, that we can attribute to the intervention, and it wasn't just due to people getting their partners tested. So just to summarize, I think one thing that is pretty clear from the data is that um, we need to do more work to help women get their partners tested since the uptake of partner testing was much lower for women than for men. And we were very encouraged that the intervention was effective for both people who tested positive and for those who tested negative. Um, however, our study has a number of limitations. It was a non-randomized study design. We had a relatively short follow-up period, and we relied on self-report. Um, but I'd like to just end with that even in the era of treatment as prevention and PrEP, behavior is still important in that if we want the interventions to be effective, people actually have to use them. So I think our data suggests that behavior change is both important and possible. Um, so I just want to thank my, first of all, the participants in our study, my collaborators, um, the National Institutes of Mental Health, um, and my research assistants and students. Thank you, Susan, for the excellent presentation.